Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. Mr. Murda, it's a pleasure to have you on. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. Always a pleasure. Enjoy it. I got a big question for you. You ready for it? Sure. What happened to the hippies? <laughs> what happened to the hippies? <laughs> Lots of things. Okay. <laughs> Lots of things. In many ways, they self-destructed. I mean, it was an, it was destined to be one of those ephemeral sociocultural movements. We've had several in history. Some have lasted longer than others. But I think they represent the perfect storm of 1960s youth, post-World War II youth, in the sense that by the late 50s, early 60s, for a variety of historical factors, you had a very affluent, white, mostly suburban, <clears throat> middle class. And the 50s was a decade that was notorious for its mass conformity. You, you start off, for example, you start off with the, the decade with the politics of anti-communism, the most severe in, our, in the republic's history, with McCarthyism and his reign of terror which only, only lasted for four years, but you can do a lot of damage in four years. And that was a result of the Cold War hysteria. Uh, the generation of my parents' generation, I think I, I, we mentioned this to you, I mentioned this to you before. When you look at that, my parents' generation, people born in the 20s, lived through the Great Depression, then followed by World War II, their entire post-war lives was defined by three things, stability, security, prosperity, right? And most achieved it. My father did, for sure. Um, and they wanted to pass on that type of legacy to their children. Well, the 50s, because again, because of the Cold War with McCarthyism, you created this mass hysteria, this kind of rumbling constantly below the surface of every American, fear of a conflict with the Soviets that would result in nuclear or atomic at that time, destruction of the planet. And, and but more importantly, inside the suburb, inside this, this, this sociocultural entity, you had this incredible desire of of mass conformity, homogenization, acquisitive, acquisitiveness, materialism. It's amazing. In, in growing up, I had it all as a kid. I was very fortunate, right? I had, we had cars and latest clothes and styles. And that's a, that's a that depression mentality that my parents carried over with them and wanted to be. To, to bestow upon their children such a large S, right? However, it also created a restlessness. It's like, is this all there is to life? Is this it? Going shopping at the mall? New car every couple of years? <clears throat> you know, dances, girls, all that. Is, there's got to be something more. And rock and roll, I think, helped to open that door, late 50s, the first golden age of rock and roll with Elvis Presley, Chuck Berry, uh, the Big Bopper, Little Richard, all those, uh, Buddy Holly, my God, Roy Orbison. And the music itself <clears throat> was brand new. And most parents didn't like it for a variety of reasons. And so that kind of was a reflection of the restlessness that my generation was feeling in those suburbs. And, and then you have John Kennedy come along and tell American youth, and you, have, I, you and I have talked about this before, his greatest legacy is to inspire an entire generation of young people to want to do more of their lives than go to the mall, have a nice car, fancy clothes, pretty girlfriends, rah, rah, boom, boom, right? Creates the Peace Corps and calls upon us. Now, looking back, how genuine was Kennedy's call upon youth to call to arms for the youth, that's always debatable, right? But I think the intent was good, but I think the message got a little bit lost. I mean, yeah, it, it got lost, particularly when, as the war accelerated. 
You had guys rushing to the Peace Corps who could care less about joining the Peace Corps, just want to escape the draft. They couldn't find the country that they were going to be sent to on a map if you pointed it to them. They were, you know, oblivious to it. Not too different from today with people putting up posts about places they can't point to to Gaza on a map. So, Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, good luck. My students couldn't find Gaza. They never heard of Gaza. Um, and so I think this then started the trend of a rejection of white, middle-class, suburban culture, mores, norms, as, so, as being plastic and superficial. And you have this massive search, both from the student radicals and the hippies, for authenticity, right, in their lives, something real. And the, and the, the, the beats kind of introduced my generation to that Jack Kerouac with On the Road, especially, and a few other beat authors. But then you have the emergence of the hippies, right? Who rejected, at least on the surface, <laughs> rejected virtually everything that white middle class suburbia had, had, had believed was essential for the good life in America. And you got to remember, too, 99.999% of the hippies, I'm exaggerating a little bit, are from those suburbs. White middle class kids, very affluent. They can afford to play hippie. And in my book I wrote on the hippies, I'm, we talked about that. You had maybe 10, 15% of the hippies, genuine. And they will become so disgusted with the pseudo hippies, the proto hippies, the weekend hippies in San Francisco, in Greenwich Village in New York, or even in Austin, Texas, that they will leave those urban enclaves and go back to the country. So the commune movement will be very strong, not in the 60s, but in the 70s, as a reaction to the disgust that genuine alternative lifestyles wanted. And, but if you look at the hippie legacy, it's 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 uh, it's somewhat profound, I and mean, it's not as important to say American liberalism politically, or even the New Left SDS. But it created this belief, and it's, I think it's filtered down to your generation to question authority. That the elders don't have all the answers. They may have some of the answers, but they don't have all the answers. Question what you learn in school. Right? Professors, yeah, we're smart guys, but we don't have all the answers. What percentage of the people were actually hippies, though, back then? Like, which were the real percentage compared to the proto hippies and the more people that were? Oh, just you'd doing say, I would say genuine hippies, maybe 10 to 15 percent. And they're like, for example, you can still <clears throat> find those genuine hippies in a place like the farm. A commune started in the early 70s by Michael Gaskin. In uh, in Tennessee, a little town, Tennessee. I wrote an article about that. I think I shared it with you. And they're still they're still around, still around. So it just it, it was a to me as an historian it was a momentary reaction, outburst, rejection of white middle class suburban mores, cultural norms, materialism, etc. But if you look closely. <laughs> at the hippies, they became one of the premier consumers of all the things they issued. There would never have been the explosion of rock and roll music, its popularity, its capitalization, its commercial commodification, had it not been for my generation of youth. Music was the crux. And hippies, man, they bought records like there was no tomorrow. I'm telling you, you bought a record. I got news for you, brother. You're involved in the capitalist process, right? And they can afford to go home, too. That's the other thing you got to remember. When it, when it got too rough, when the cops started cracking down, say, for example, the San Francisco and the hate, start bopping heads, literally, after the summer of love. If you look at the summer of love, that's the apex. The San Francisco scene, 67. And even within that context of the summer of love, 
I mentioned this in my book on the hippies, it, it very quickly degenerated into a sordid, squalid disaster, drugs and rapes. And oh, it was horrible. Do you think that was well, manipulated, though, by the government because they had that running of that hate ashbury clinic down there? I mean, offering well, that free was, drugs. That was Dave, Dr. David Smith. He was legit. That guy was legit. He was really legit. The government, LBJ, for example, he dismissed the hippies. He dismissed. He only started to work. Hippies he never took seriously. Never. Because he knew. He's an old Texan. What can you, what can you expect? He's an ephemeral. It was ephemeral. Until 1967-68, Johnson always worried, him, and I've heard this on his telephone conversations, in his memos, and his private memos to, say, George Bundy, Walt Rostow, to his, to, his, to his wise men, as he called them. He always feared that the right, the far right, would destroy its administration, the Republicans which really wasn't that accurate. What destroyed LBJ, and that's the consensus among everybody you could have on this show, was the war. That destroyed it. Destroyed him, the great society, American liberalism, obliterated, right? But he began to grow a little weary of the student radicals, particularly African-Americans, the Black Panthers, when, when Stokely Tart, Stokely Carmichael took over SNCC in 66, and the mantra was black power in that term, that really disturbed LBJ. Because in his mind, how could you betray me like this when I have delivered so much? Well, LBJ, yeah, you did in 64 and 65, but you're just getting started. And again, it goes back to the war. The funding for housing, better schools for African Americans, particularly in the, in, in the ghettos. LBJ, if you look at the Civil Rights Act of 64, 65, those acts were pretty much almost exclusively designed for African American oppression in the South, because that's where MLK had focused his entire movement. But by the time you get to the 1960s, man, you've got two different African-American lives, communities. You've got a northern urban ghetto, ghettoized black community, and a southern black community, which is totally different. And LBJ could not, I mean, he was aware of the, those, the differences that existed. But again, as he gets more and more distracted by the war and funding, it's moved from programs of the Great Society that could ameliorate it, the conditions, particularly in the North. You would never have had the long, hot summers. If you look at the long, hot summers, if you start with Watts, but Watts is kind of an anomaly. 65 in L.A., August. That's ongoing in L.A. Rodney King later on. L.A. cops are notoriously word. I don't know where, where they are now. They're still corrupt. Yeah, corrupt, brutal, vicious. And you saw that with Rodney King. You saw that. With RFK. In, yeah, with Watts in 65. When Watts exploded in 65, it rocked LBJ, but it didn't once he understood the issue. And the issue was police brutality in that ghetto. And that's what ignited Watts. But fast forward to, say, the hot, long, hot summer of 67, Detroit, Newark. There were over 150 cities exploded in 67. Days of rioting. That was deeper. That reflected deeper, deeper issues. Poverty, despair, unemployment, housing discrimination, police brutality. We see that still with George Floyd, even though George Floyd was no saint, but still. We saw with other other people who were innocent African Americans. That's an ongoing issue. Black Lives Matter, in many ways, is 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 a civil rights movement picking up where Johnson liberals, sixties liberals, left off. And sadly, the far right, Trump and those guys, they don't care about any of that. 
Republican Party could care less. I mean, I don't, in your own in, in your own city, when that bridge collapsed, yeah. collapsed a couple of weeks ago, Baltimore, you I'm, you're you know you're savvy, you're well informed. You had a bunch of far right Republicans accusing that bridge collapse on immigration because the bulk of the workers who were working on that bridge, who died in the process, were uh, Hispanic workers, illegal immigrants. My main thing when that bridge would collapse, I was like, this is going to jack up prices in grocery stores even more. You think the supply chain's bad now? Wait till that starts well, going. We'll see well, the ramifications. Well, yeah, for infrastructure, yeah. I was telling my class, there's there's still a lot of infrastructure around from the 30s, from the great New Deal New Deal projects. <laughs> from the 30s. I mean, bridges, uh, turnpikes, roads. I mean, all kinds of I was like, Hoover Dam was built. Yeah. And completed in thirty-eight. My God, by the um not PW, yeah, PW PWA. So well, bringing it back to Johnson, why do you think so many people look at Johnson unfavorably? I mean, his presidency wasn't necessarily the best when it came to the stature of what we probably view as what we want a president to be. Um, but it was effective in a sense. I know people don't want to mention that, mention that, but I've, like I said, I've used this example multiple times because you've said it to me and I really have seen documentation to back it up. But it's I'd rather have Hoover uh, inside my tent pissing out than outside my tent pissing in. You know, this this idea of you have two heavyweights that are filled with political, I would say, influence and corruption um, that both understand how this relationship has to work, a devil's embrace. You know, I got dirt on you, you got dirt on me, and this is how we run politics. But in that, in a sense, we might not view that as being a good president. But when you really examine it from a way to get things done and get actual things you want passed, that is how politics works. And that is a lot what a lot of people don't mention about. And Truman and many others have mentioned hints of that, of how the interpolitical yeah. system works. Yes, they, he and no one. No president of the 20th century, except perhaps FDR, but we'll never know because these issues were completely moot to FDR. He had all power. He was virtually addicted, do whatever he wanted to do. But no president, no politician better understood the workings of Congress, House, Senate, judicial system than Johnson. His whole life was defined and determined by politics. He lived, breathed sweated politics. He was brilliant, a brilliant politician. And had Kennedy listened more to LBJ, Kennedy might have been responsible for the first Civil Rights Act, but he was moving glacially, so glacially in that direction. He was so timid. Kennedy was, for a variety of somewhat legitimate reasons. But Johnson knew it. And Johnson, having grew, grown up in Texas in the Hill Country, he understood that kind of southern rural mentality that he knew he had to win over, because it was all rural, rural still is, where he grew up. And he, remember also, he, he was a school teacher. He, he taught in some of the, taught in a, a, an all African American segregated school in uh, Houston for a couple of years. And before that, he taught, taught in Cotula, which is in kind of South Texas, all Hispanic kids. So he understood African Americans and Hispanics pretty well, right? He didn't want to deliver the goods. When you look at LBJ, what drove him, he wanted to become the greatest president of all time. So ego, right? And that same was, same was true with Roosevelt, right? In fact, FDR was one of Roosevelt's favorites. LBJ comes to Congress in 38 in, as a member of the House. So he, and very quickly, because Texas is very important politically already, remember John Nance Garner, his, his LB, uh, FDR's vice president, Sam Rayburn, Speaker of the House, all Texans, right? So LBJ, uh, FDR took LBJ under his wing, was, gonna, was grooming him, uh, others, but he liked LBJ. LBJ, he, LBJ took him fishing out in the Gulf. FDR came down, to, they went fishing out in the Gulf. Off coast of Gal off Galveston, deep sea fishing. Love that stuff. The FDR did. And so very early on, he becomes this mentor, this scion for, for LBJ. And he modeled his entire political career after Roosevelt. They were very, very close. 
once LBJ becomes president, his goal is to pick up where the new where FDR left off with the New Deal because of the war and take it even further. Hence, he calls his, his agenda the Great Society, the most ambitious, visionary, visionary reform impulse in the history of the United States. And if you look at the first two years after he's reelected, by greatest, he also wins the greatest landslide ever. It's 60.2% 60, 60 of the popular vote. Now, the FDR never got close to that, right? That's great, amazing. You talk about stupid candidate for the Republicans. Goldwater was a complete disaster in 64 for the Republicans. <laughs> a choice, not an echo. Yeah, right. Uh -huh. It's like for us Democrats in 72. Looking back, I worked on the McGovern campaign in 72. I was a volunteer staffer. Uh, that was a bad choice for Democrats in 72. It was George McGovern. Nice guy. Brilliant. Ex-history professor. College level. But Nixon just walloped him. Nixon was going to win anyway. Regardless. But anyway, so when LBJ wins the presidency in his own right, right, even before, even before the election, this is very symbolic. He is invited by the students at the University of Michigan, already the vanguard of student activism, student radicalism, Tom Hayden and the boys, Al Haber. But they invite him. SDS is already formed. They invite Johnson to give the uh, commencement, graduation commencement address. That's extremely symbolic. So you still have faith in soon-to-be radicals in liberalism. The LBJ goes up there and he gives a fabulous commencement address. And that's when he introduces June of 64, the Great Society. He gets a standing ovation for minutes. Students, faculty. So University of Michigan is cruel, crucial. That'd be gone, like going to Berkeley or UT or a major pub, public university. LBJ did not like the Ivies. Not at all. He saw them as bastions of elitism and privilege and pseudo sophistication. In many ways, he's right. Well, he never invited any of them onto his ranch. No, never. He didn't like them at all. But the public university, because he's public university, Texas State, for God's sake, in San Marcos, right? And he always, where's his library? The University of Texas, right? His presidential library. It's like a museum. You ever come down? I'll take you there. It is like it's the most incredible archives and a museum. It is unbelievable. Every, anybody goes, every historian who goes there said, this is the best library. It is the president. I haven't been to any. I've been to what? Two presidential libraries? Two I've seen. That's the best. <laughs> I've right been now. online to some, but that's about it. Yeah, yeah. No, that's it's, it's unbelievable. And what else was really good about LBJ, he left everything, good, bad, indifferent. He didn't hold back anything. His phone conversation, he's the first president to seriously tap the White House, so to speak. He has fantastic conversations with, you name it, he's got conversations with. And you can hear him very clearly with a George Wallace cajoling and browbeating him to integrate. You can hear him with Daly after 68, the Democratic Convention, the bloodbath up there in 68. You can hear him with everybody. He leaves it all for posterity. And it's good. And, and it's historically, it's, it's invaluable. But he's very honest. I mean, he says, geez, I don't know what to do. And he shakes his head. I don't know what to do. What are we going to do about this? What are we going to I, I think I failed, right? And then he, by 68, not, not even, by 67, the war has taken its toll. And when that's why you have the long, hot summers of 67, because under his great society, he had promised, he wanted to create in the African-American urban ghettos, he wanted to replicate for them white suburbia. School, good schools, libraries, playgrounds, 
parks, right? Decent housing. And it was called the Model, Model City Program. Now, is there, was there a political agenda of that? Yeah. <laughs> White suburbanites sure as hell didn't want African-Americans moving out to their communities. LBJ was always aware of that. You had horrible racism in the North. And as much as I hate to admit it, largely driven by the 60s by ethnics. The very ethnics who were once ghettoized themselves, i.e. the Italians, the Irish. Do you believe that was a little bit of pre-stigma from kind of the old mobsters as well, too, that were kind of ingrained in some of these places? I mean, a lot of them were from either Italian backgrounds or Cuban backgrounds or had some yeah, type of foreign background. Mostly, mostly Italian. Cuba, Cubans are on an issue in the 60s. But yeah, a lot of those Italians. Mostly well, Santos Traficante was kind of a little bit of an issue. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But if you look at the ethnics in those neighborhoods, who had worked their way toward whiteness, they got the American dream now, man, and they want nothing to upset it. And they're going to blame LBJ for a lot of, for all those, quote, riots. They're going to blame him. And that's when you see the shift amongst old ethnics, Italians, Irish, you know, Hungarians, Southern, Eastern European types. They start drifting toward the Republican Party. If you look at George Wallace, Wallace's primary uh, run in 68, he wins Michigan and Wisconsin in that primary. LBJ's out. He's already dropped out of the race, but he wins those primaries. Just, we're not talking Alabama or, or Mississippi, some cracker state. We're talking about Michigan and Wisconsin, two working class, largely ethnic, working blue collar workers. And by 68, they hate them. the same ethnics who hung on FDR's every word and the Democratic Party's every word from the 30s through the 60s. This is that blue-collar vote that the Democrats have lost that you hear Biden trying to pull back in his speeches. They're gone. They're gone. There's no way you're going to get those people back to the Democratic Party. I don't see a chance. I mean, and also because they were all, all blue collar, but they were all members of very powerful unions. And that was key. FDR did a brilliant job of tying union power to the Democratic Party. If you look at the unions, AFL, CIO, UAW, with the mine workers, all those guys just pulled the blue lever. I don't care if it was for dog catcher. Straight Democrat from the 30s, from 36 on. And by 68, both Walls and Nixon start to suck that vote away where it's gone today. I'll give you a dollar for every blue collar ethnic vote for a Democrat. I'd who still had, come out ahead. Who had the biggest problems with the hippie movement? Was it Nixon or was it Johnson? Because I think Nixon. No, Johnson, gets... like not, not, not LBJ. LBJ never worried about. The youth rebellion until the 67, 68. It was the anti-war movement that began to really bother him. Okay. And he'd always tell his aides, don't worry about, this is verbatim what he told uh, Walt Rostow, don't worry about those little shits on the campuses. Worry about the right. And then when you look at that statement, it's very prophetic because- A lot of people associate Johnson as being a Republican. Well, he's not a Republican, but he feared the Republican right. And he believed that if he wasn't a hawk on the war, did come after and destroy him. I've heard numerous, I've listened to numerous phone conversations he has with um, Daly and others, Democratic friends, hardcore Democrats. And he always expresses this fear. But the right never brought him down. In the end, the anti-war protest brought him down. There's your legacy relative to the student radical hippies now. In only a few communities did, did you see an alliance form between the hippie counterculture and, and the politicos. Austin was one of them. This is my latest book. It's what I'm writing about. 
But in most of, in the West Coast, Berkeley completely polarized. The politicals and the hippies across the Bay. New York, same thing, right? Only a handful, you had a handful of what were called Prairie Power campuses, UT, Kansas, uh, Oklahoma, University of Oklahoma, Kansas, um, Southern Illinois. This is where this was the heart and soul of Prairie Power. And Prairie Power was a combination of the SDS and the hippie community. And together, when they united, it represented a fairly formidable force on those campuses as far as anti war, university reform, et cetera. Can we go in a little bit more about some of the actions that are going on in college campuses? Because that's always been an interest for me because there was an influx of so much going on there. I mean, when did communism finally start to become prominent on college campuses and the idea of Marxism as well, too? Because those beliefs were starting to trick these. Well, communism, I would say a little bit more now. I'm coming across like weird stuff on college campuses now about people with little booths set up talking about communism where I'm like, we're all very distorted. Why can't people just watch TV and go to bed? It's so easy. It's not that difficult. Like I get people have beliefs and stuff, but we obviously all can't agree and it just causes more fighting. So I'm like, just watch some Netflix, please. Yeah, yeah, right. Watch Netflix. Very good. Mindless Netflix. Um, now, if you look at the SDS, this it's a very complicated story, but SDS, as I mentioned before, the new left. FDS, SDS becomes its most important organization, exclusively white, upper middle class kids. Right? Again, they share that in common with the hippies. Okay? Parents are well educated. Most of them are college graduates, their parents are. So they come from a very post war, very affluent sector of American youth. They can afford to go to college, right? And once they're in college, they don't have to work their way through college, right? So they're, they live in a very rarefied environment, which gives them gave them plenty of time to dabble in all kinds of political theory and philosophy, okay? But if you look at SDS, SDS, Students for a Democratic Society, it starts out coexisting amicably, amicably with liberalism, with traditional liberals, Kennedy Johnson. And interestingly, their first gambit into social action is the civil rights movement. If you look at every major SDS leader, from Hayden to Greg Calvert to Jeff Sherrill here in Texas, all of them, they get their first taste of social social change with the civil rights movement. Mostly with SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And they go south in, during the summer, get their head bashed in by the local cops and other, the Klan, whatever. And they experienced for several years what it was like to be black in the south. It was a searing experience for these white kids, okay? They never really understood it until they became part of it. And initially, African-American SNCC welcomed the white workers, right? The more the better, the beloved community, okay? And then SDS tried to organize a similar program called ERAP, Economic Research and development program in the, in northern urban ghettos to try to politicize poor whites and poor blacks in northern cities like Detroit, Newark, Cleveland, Pittsburgh, Baltimore was one of the target cities. And they quickly found out that genuinely poor people don't care about politics. They worry about where their next meal comes from, jobs. Yeah. As you can well imagine. That's why I'd say Netflix and sleep. That's why I don't have time to care about all the politics anymore. I'm barely surviving over here. And they didn't want to be politicized, didn't care about taking charge of the community. Right? And they did like the idea of putting greater pressure on the welfare system in those cities 
to deliver the goods more timely and such. But Arap was a dismal failure because these poor people, many of them ethnics and African-American, resented like hell these rich, urban, college-educated white kids coming into the neighborhood and tell them how to live, what to do, with no real understanding of the true plight of the nation's urban poor. They had no understanding. How could they? <coughs> they grew up in complete, incredible affluence. So that program failed. And then in 66, with the rise of black power within SNCC, to the shock of white radicals, Stokely kicks them all out. You want to go organize people? Go organize your own neighborhoods. Go organize against white racism. We don't want you here anymore. That was a blow to SDS and white radicals. They're going, blah, 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 blah. Because all, they had this vision of the beloved community and all this interracial harmony. That was all bullshit. They never wanted that. African American, even in SNCC's earliest years under the leadership of guys like John Lewis and such, there was always this uneasy, unspoken tension between the white kids coming from the North and mostly 90% Southern African American, Bob Moses, all these guys. They tolerated, and even King did. He knew King could not get what he wanted unless he had white support. He knew it. But black power guys said, the hell with it. All the white support has got us nothing. And he's right. Stokely was right. And so he kicked out and kicked out the radicals. Now they didn't know what to do with themselves. And guess what they found their next cause to be? Anti-war. Something more universal. But even then, African Americans did not participate in the anti war movement, which is interesting because by 67, black guys comprised close to 25% of the troops yeah. in Vietnam. Largely front lines, too. Yes, they're the fodder, man. Vietnam is a rich man's war, a poor man's fight, writ large par excellence. And we, and we know that now. At the time, you didn't. Yeah, if you look at El if you look at Johnson, he gets a lot of pressure. First of all, the draft is going to be a factor in the destruction of his administration, downfall of his administration. But he craters because all of a sudden, affluent white families start to complain. Wait a minute, no, 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 no. My kid's gone to college. He's not going off some 13,000 miles of some damn jungles and get killed. No. I created the American dream. Part of that American dream for him is to go to college. So you had white middle class affluent families say, no, no, draft is not for my kid. Go draft this poor white kid or black kid or Hispanic kid. He, he Make him the cabin father. Not my kid. He's going to college. He's going to get the American dream. And LBJ creators and institutes the lottery. Do you know what I'm talking about, the lottery? The lottery is where like, you would be able to play, and then if your card or number got called, then that means that you wouldn't have to go into the draft. No, the opposite. Oh, you would have to go into the draft. You would, right. It's like so, fucking Hunger Games. Yes, exactly. That's terrible. Yeah, it's hor horribly discriminatory against poor kids, white, black, or green. And the white kid still gets it to us to certain deferment. That's what I, I got one. As long as I stayed, as long as one stayed in college, maintain a whopping 2.0 GPA, please, any jackass can do that. And took at least 12 credit hours or more, you were deferred. Well, who's being deferred? Rich white kids. Yeah, because who's able to go to college and be black? And precisely. You got it. And so that was unfair, but that's the LBJ kind of crater to that. LBJ politically always said to be successful, you got to maintain what he called the consensus. The Johnson consensus was by the 60s, 
white middle class America. As long as you had them on board, you can do anything. And he's right. He was right for a while. First thing, for example, he does before he introduces the Civil Rights Act of 64 is he gives white middle class America a huge tax cut. Nothing is more endearing to white middle class Americans than a tax cut. Right? Anytime. And that got them on their side. And then LBJ also used JFK's assassination, make the country feel guilty and bad. And when he introduced his the Civil Rights Act of 64, he gave a wonderful speech, fabulous speech. And in that speech, he invoked Kennedy's name about 15 million times with the, with the refrain, what better way to pay tribute to our late, great, dead president than to pass his civil rights bill? It wasn't his bill. It was Johnson's bill. Kennedy had, you want to call it a bill before in in the in in the house before he's killed, but it was already being butchered by the Republicans and Southern Democrats. Never would have passed. Never. Um, hell, he wouldn't have. It would. It wasn't. It was not even going to get out of committee. Forget it. And so. Johnson knew this, but he said, before I do that, I've got to get white America, white middle class America, my side, give him a tax break. His Civil Rights Act of 64 flew through Congress like unbelievable. I mean, it was like an FDR moment, rubber stamp, because he was brilliant at that. And then he also knew that Northern whites, the last thing they wanted to see in the 60s, and I mentioned this kind of a little bit earlier, was any type of mass migration of brutalized African Americans out of the South into Northern cities, suburbs. That's racism. And so LBJ knew this. And so consequently, what does he do? He realizes that, hey, they're going to support my civil rights bill. They don't want to see on TV anymore the fire hoses, the police dogs, Bull Connor, the beatings, the churches exploding and killing little African-American girls. They didn't. Americans get horrified by that. This, our image looks bad. And did, did the Soviets and the communists make, hey, with, with that sunshine, you better believe it. Oh, my God. So you always got the Cold War. In the background, affecting all this. Amplifying. Ah, oh, yeah. And Johnson knew this. And that's why when you when Johnson gets sucked into Vietnam, he should have... Rumor has, I think you and I have talked before, Kennedy was contemplating getting us out. Yeah, but I mean, I'm, I, I would like to think he would, but there's not really evidence to say besides him making an off statement to somebody, but... Precisely, precisely. And the hawks within his own party, including the CIA, there was no way. The, those guys that were, at that time, hardcore cold warriors. And so, I don't think so. I mean, he may have slowly... De-escalated. I mean, I'm being. I mean, generous. pulling out advisors and doing things of that sort. Sure, I know he wanted troops out by a certain extended period, but we never got to see when that was going to unfold. But if you really examine it from America getting a loss on their record, do you really think patriots of the community that support this uh, idea of American exceptionalism would want to see a loss on their record? Because retreating would be a loss. Yeah, that was LBJ. He told Doris Kearns his biographer, uh, whom he really opened up to. It's a great book. You should read that. Um, that he would be, he did not want to become obsessed with not becoming the first president to lose a war. So there you go. 
I mean, that's the same thing for Nixon. It's why, like, I'm interested in people that have a different take than the historical record of Nixon, because he could have easily blown the roof off the place with all the secrets he knew about the intelligence community, but he kept his mouth mouth shut about stuff. And I think he viewed it as, I didn't want to be the president that laid all the national secrets on the line to save his own ass. You know what I mean? Because there'd be more hellfire that came with it. Oh, sure. Nixon was delusional, paranoid. He was... I'm no psychologist or psychiatrist, but he had some issues. Yeah, I mean, right? towards the end, he was walking through the White House wall, uh, hallways, drunk, talking to the paintings. So I would love to be there. I would love no, yeah. to be on Ooh, that I'm, conversation. Yeah. Yeah, Haldeman and Eric been covered for him all the time. One thing he said about Nixon, he built an incredibly fanatically loyal coterie around him. Those guys, boy, every president wished they had those kind of hardcore true believers around them. Every one of them. I mean, if you listen to his speeches and stuff like that, there, it's not something I would be like, this isn't the Nixon that everyone has talked about being a bumbling idiot. I mean, he's talking about the culture and he's very, very well spoken when he does speak. Now, though, my only complaint about Nixon's speeches is that I think he was very sexually repressed. And I say that because I've never used, heard so many sexual euphemisms put into speeches. He'd be like thrusting and, you know, and I'm just like, why are you using those words? Pick anything yeah. else. Yeah. Well, if you look at it, if you listen to his conversations, his taped conversations with all of his advisors, he's really swears all the time. I mean, he's really a raunchy guy. Yeah. But the public never saw that. He's, whatever you say about Nixon, he was brilliant academically, intellectually, well-read, well-informed. I was smart as hell. Just had some little few screws loose. I mean, 10 times, LBJ was a brilliant politician. LBJ wasn't stupid, but he was no great intellect. Nixon was an intellect. Kennedy was an intellect, right? Uh, well, it's the biggest question if he thought Nixon would have won that debate against Kennedy if it wasn't televised. Apparently, oh, he, the percentage... He was on the radio, yeah. Yeah, the he percentage does. of the people that listened to him on the radio said that he beat Kennedy in that. But then the number of people that saw him on television saw that Nixon was sweaty and he really didn't have time to for some things. And like I said, I'm kind of the same with Nixon and Kennedy from what I've looked at is that I've seen both of these people targeted in different scenarios. Kennedy, if you believe the assassination stuff and then Nixon, when it comes to being targeted for Watergate, it never made sense to me. We don't have a real conclusive answer of why Watergate happened how these ex-cia people got caught by putting tape on a door to me that just doesn't make sense you know these guys have done plenty of covert operations before it's not like this was their first rodeo but a janitor caught a paul blart caught him like come on yeah, yeah. Paul, blart. paul blart. yeah right now i i think it was just a botched job i mean these guys were still, the thing is we talked about this before you and i Nixon didn't have to do any of this. I mean, he went, he didn't know about this, but his henchmen didn't have to do any of that. He was going to win in a cakewalk anyway. The Democratic Party was so polarized by 72. I mean, even if Muskie, because he, he, he Nixon unleashed a horrible dirty tricks campaign against Muskie because he thought Muskie was the greater, Edmund Muskie, Maine, was a greater threat and a better candidate, which he was. And then he put so much unrelenting dirt out there on Muskie, which wasn't true, Muskie bowed out. Time to get to the convention, Democratic convention in 72, McGovern's the only guy standing. Well, Nixon was done when Agnew left or when, when he was pushed out because Agnew was the only defensive line when it came to the media and media is everything. And even in today's times, it's even more so. But back then... You know, Kennedy's amount of television things that he did compared to other presidents before him and after him as well, too. I mean, a lot of these boost up your eyes and what the public views more than an actual speech does at campuses. But Nixon and Johnson also visited a lot of campuses, too. They knew that was a vote that they needed to get in their pocket. Oh, sure they did. Sure they did. That was went to a lot of campuses. During the end, he didn't go. He, nah, he continued to go all the way through 67, early 68. Even though he's booed and heckled and jeered, he still went, man. He still went. That's that's, that's some courage. But it was it was hard for him. He was devastated. I told you the story when, after he left the White House, he dies in 73. The last couple of years of his life, he would get on his horse. It's a true story. And ride around, just ride around kind of aimlessly, mindlessly, his, his, his ranch. 
but he'd grown his hair yeah, down yeah, yeah. to his shoulders. He looked pretty good. He looked pretty good. Yeah, if you saw a photo of it. And poor man, LBJ is one of the great tragedies of American political history, I think, personally. But he, would, he could have been a great president. I even have new leftists, SDSers, Texans, fellow Texans, who are, I've interviewed for my book, most recent book. In fact, I'm doing a radio show on What's Friday. What's it called? Uh, I haven't come up with a title yet. I've got a couple of titles. It won't come out until next year. So, but I'll, when it gets closer, I'll tell you. Yeah, we'll be promoting the hell out of that thing. Thank you. Um, the publisher has one title that they want. I don't know if I'm comfortable with it, so I don't want to say anything yet. But I'm almost done. But I'm, I'm doing a radio show called The Rag Blog on Friday with Thorne Dreyer, who was the editor of um, The Rag, one of the most uh, prominent underground papers. He and I have become great friends, along with the, with the other, other group. They're a few years, few years older than me. And every one of them say that, and not just his fellow Texans, but they said that LBJ could have been a great president, one of the greatest. They really believed in him. And then the war. The war just shattered all their, all his credibility with the new left. There's a quote that rings really true to me that I kind of like to think about and really mention sometimes, but a lot of people, it's hard for them. Sometimes it falls on deaf ears. But it's show me a young man who isn't liberal. I'll show you a young man with no heart. Show me an old man who isn't conservative. I'll show you an old man with no experience. And it's no wisdom. No wisdom. Yeah, no wisdom. And it's really when I talk to Abe Peck, Abe Peck of the Chicago Seed. Yeah, he, I asked him, did you regret anything? Did you think looking back with all these years of hindsight? Did you look back? And he goes, there was a lot of mistakes we did in the beginning. We were way too full with emotion. And just hearing him say that and reflecting on it, I was like, it's hard to not have that after years and years and understanding how kind of things work a little bit differently than you do when you're maybe in your 20s. And, you know, and to me, that's interesting because these impacts in these movements and plus, what's your interest in the examination of history, but specifically when we examine presidencies? When I start to dive deeper down into them, I start looking at people in a whole new lights and certain perspectives start to reign true out of them and certain perspectives begin to be shattered of, amongst fellow colleagues of mine that are JFK fans. I'm a fan of JFK 100%, but I've relooked and bothered to take the time into looking into Johnson and Nixon a little bit more, even though some of them won't even entertain the discussion. But to me, it's just interesting because everyone's got their good moments and their bad moments. Oh yeah, even like like I said with Nixon, I have I have when I look when I take a big step back with Nixon and divorce myself from the emotion of emotionalism of Watergate and all the other bullshit corruption he pulled off. Yeah, pull the Nixon burger. How could you not love the Nixon burger? <laughs> Nixon burger, yeah. It's like a Obama burger. He goes to five guys. Mm -hmm. um, Nixon was a a very his first term is pretty effective. Now, where I have a hard time with Nixon, which LBJ thought would have never entered LBJ's head for a fleeting second, was Kent State. Because the buck stops with Nixon, because the governor does not, is not allowed, and you know this, cannot call out the national car without first getting the president's approval. And when Nixon gave his approval to allow the Ohio governor to call out those National Guard idiots and kill those five kids at Kent State, that was a turning point. Nixon had campaigned on law and order, and by God, he delivered the goods. And if you look at the movement, from that moment on, May of 70, it just precipitously, completely collapses. And the way I see that is, I'm sure Peck would admit this, Sure, you had moments in the 60s like Chicago and other violent confrontations between the radicals, student radicals and the cops and law enforcement and stuff. But no one was ever shot and killed. Yeah, they may have been beaten by the cops up in Chicago in 68, mercilessly, Jesus. But they provoked a lot of that. Jerry Rubin, those guys provoked a lot of that, in all honesty. But did their provocations warrant Having their heads split open? No, no. But when you look at Kent State and the killing of those five kids, it's like to tell my class, 
this isn't this isn't the French youth of the sixties where you, where they where they literally threw up the barricades in in Paris in sixty eight. They were ready to fight street to street, corner to corner, De Gaulle's government with whatever they could find. When this happens in the United States, those kids all go home. They said, ah, it's not worth it. It's clear Nixon's going to shoot us, and I'm not that committed. This is not Germany in the 60s, and certainly not France. Those French kids, the French know how to put on a revolution. They always have. <laughs> and they put one on in 68 as well. You go back and look at that, the days of rage in Paris in the 60s, unbelievable. Unbelievable. Those French students were not going to take it. German students did either. How many of the hippies in the in the United States, how many of the hippies that were part of the culture, the proto-hippies are the ones that were just doing it to hop on a trend? I mean, how much do you believe that it was a way of just being able to rebel and have this kind of throw against the establishment? Because that became an overall sentiment of the hippie movement. Besides the real hippies who actually believed and stood there from the beginning, there became the violent weathermen. There became other factors that started to really bring down the law when it came to um, certain actions of the United States government that honestly did really affect the hippie movement in probably the worst ways. But those weren't technically really hippies. Those were more no, radicals. No, no, they're the radicals. They're, no, but, but but white America, mainstream America is going to lump them all together and accuse of SDS or, or a weatherman of being Yeah, hippie. throw Manson in there. Yeah, throw Manson in there. Yeah, he was a hippie. Going, going crazy. He had long hair. I saw it. Yeah, of course. There you go. And that's exactly what Manson. Manson will help also contribute to the demise. You got to remember, too, about with the hippie movement, it becomes very quickly commodified by American capitalism. And they made fortunes. Records close. What's that clothing store? Not the Gap. What's it called? Got started in San Francisco in 69. Still around. The Gap? You know what that? I don't think it's the Gap. What's what's the clothing store? I'm going to ask my wife. She knows. What's the clothing store that got started in 69 San Francisco? Still around? Not the Gap. uh... Goodwill? Huh? Goodwill? No, not Goodwill. (laughs) Oh, not with us two. Uh, Anyway, it'll come to me. Jesus, getting old, man. Um, it was so quickly commodified with the music and clothing. And that's how it, and that's how it eventually was destroyed. It's because if you look, hippies eschewed all that, and yet they enveloped it. And if you look at the 1960s, the hippie movement in particular, it probably generated more revenue for American corporations than any previous fashion movement or fashionable hip movement. Millions, tens of millions of dollars were made. And I tell you, every time the hippies would buy a record, they were contributing to it. So. Was it in Nashville? No, it was it was founded by husband and wife team in 69 in San Francisco. It's a major chain Maybe it was the gap. Started out with Levi's, just Levi's, and a few, you know, hippie commodities. Maybe it was the gap. I think it was Gap. Was it the uh, hippie Jimmy Siegel? No, no. I forgot the, fam- the Fisher family, I think, or whatever they called it. it. was the Fishers. You said Fisher. I have to look it up. You can look it up in my book. I have to find out <laughs> where it was. But it was in San Francisco. Just off by the Fisherman, just off the Hate and Fisherman's Wharf area. They made a fortune. And that's and that's the thing you remember at the hippie movement, and we talked about this before, is that it's it's a flash in the pan. It's it, it's fashionable. And if you look at New York City, LA, they all embraced it. Andy Warhol, all these people just embraced it like hip and happening. And that they killed it. They just killed it. Yeah, I don't see anything that starts with a G. No. Hold on. Let me get my book and I'll tell you. Let me pause it. I got to know. Right. It's a gap. Don't doubt yourself. It was the gap. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) The Fishers. 
He made a fortune. And so then I know, and now it's associated with uh what is it, those um fanny packs. Yeah. You name it, and they, they still got it. And so they if you, when you look at the hippie movement, there's so many factors that just cause it to implode. Do you think drugs was really a part of it, or do you think that was just an add-on feature? No, it was part of the culture. I mean, it was part and parcel inbred of the culture. But do that's you think that's thing. what sunk them in the eyes of a lot of people? Oh, without question. Okay. Without question. I mean, there's there's uh, there's no debate on that. There's absolutely no debate. What's one of the reasons why Smith opened his free clinic in, in the Hay in the 60, in the 66, 67? Because he was very humanitarian physician, great doctor, and the drug overdose was just unbelievable. I mean, I used to go up to the city with my buddies and we used to go to listen to the music and you'd see guys, girls and guys strung out all over, up and down hate. Let me see that today. Yeah, 67, 68. I mean, we, I went up to San Francisco, 68. So a year after Summer of Love. And it looked like Calcutta in mm. India. I mean, squalor, the poverty, the drugs. It was like, wait a minute. In one year's time, it degenerated this quickly? Yeah. Because when, when you had that great, when you had that massive migrations of hundreds of thousands of people to San Francisco, which is a very small city, seven miles, inundated that neighborhood, you couldn't absorb it. The infrastructure simply wasn't there. And there were, I mentioned this in the book, the cops said, forget it, I, we can't police this. It's impossible. We don't have enough law enforcement. And the mayor was Alioto at the time, and he said, fine, let it go. There's nothing we can do about it. Can and I then ask, the surrounding. I was say, can I ask a small question? It's a little bit off the counterculture, but it's more about Kennedy. Why did MLK not like Kennedy? Felt betrayed. So that's plain and simple. Felt that Kennedy had kind of duped him and that Kennedy had waited too long. What motivated Kennedy was Birmingham, May, June, 63. First time you saw African-Americans fight back. And these are all, and particularly African-American youth in that city. And despite... King's constant preachings, we turn the other cheek, nonviolence, bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. That isn't going to work anymore. Even as early as 63. Shocked King, shocked Kennedy, shocked the country. This is when Bull Connor unleashes the fire hoses and the dogs. And you had a lot of younger African Americans in that city said, this is bullshit. This is enough. We're not taking it. And they fought back. In my new book, I have an account of this because it motivates Kennedy of young black guys slashing tires, slashing people's throats, going after the cops, throwing rocks, no guns, but they're not going to take it. And this was a this was a fire bell in the night, man. And Kennedy saw it. He said, whoa, shit, I better move. King saw it. He was shocked, horrified. White America saw it. Oh, freaked. And that's what prompted Kennedy to go on TV a couple days later, give his civil rights address, and promise legislation. But for King and for a growing black power movement that's still under the, under the covers, it's over. It's over. Black power was coming. It needed to. King... King knew it too, but he kept a lid on it for another couple of years. But he knew, King knew, that the government delivered, did not deliver the goods. The fierce urgency of now, he would lose, lose it out. Because he, he was very dependent upon white support, white sympathy, the government. Johnson will deliver for King. But after 65, Johnson delivers no more because he's getting sucked into the war. There was a theory for a while about the government creating hip-hop rap um, or, like, influencing it. 
Ice Cube just said it on an, from NWA, Ice Cube, the rapper, the actor. He actually talked about it on a podcast episode. He's been saying it a lot now, surprisingly, like trying to do documentary stuff about it. But apparently it was like the influence. They, he talked about the government had influence into creating hip hop rap. And it was just interesting to me because I was like, I mean, I can believe it because they definitely had programs and operations going on that were subversive in some sense. I mean, you can look at rock and roll and examine that. I mean, anything that stirs up the culture, right? I mean, not to get super like conspiracy out there, I'd have to do more research on it. But if you really look at like the amount that that resonated with the public and why wouldn't the government want to get their hands on that? Oh, sure. I mean, the government... For God's sakes, they printed a document that said prevent the rise of a black messiah. You start telling me gangster rap takes off, and the next thing you know, they're really like, okay, we got to lock that down as fast as possible. <laughs> well, yeah, you got greater fear. It's funny. If you look at all that's happened with Black Lives Matter going forward through George Floyd. Well, that went horrible, man. Those That, that whole movement turned, and that guy made millions of dollars off of this whole movement and culture. I mean, that's what happens with everything, though, right? You corrupt it, and it gets bad whenever money's involved. Oh, yeah. And if, if, if there's a way to make a buck to commodify it, it'll happen. You know, it's, it's, Damn that's, capitalism. That's, that's exactly it. <laughs> yeah, curse it all you want, but that's real. I mean, we had, I mean I've mean, i lived with that all my life. But if you look at... Um, Um, back to Johnson for a second. You asked me about how he viewed American youth at the time, the protests and stuff. It hurt his feelings deeply. He never publicly confessed that, but he confessed it to Doris Kearns. And that by the end of his presidency, he blamed himself for Vietnam. Buck stops here. And blamed himself for the death of ultimately 58,000 soldiers. He blamed himself for that and caused great depression. And he felt, and remember, but also you got to remember McNamara and those guys, they're responsible as well. And McNamara confessed that in Fog of War, which I'm sure you've seen. He confesses it. Don't blame Johnson, blame me. He, based on my numbers, my advice, my consultation, he escalated. And then and he also, if you go back and look at Watch Fog, where he also made, something, made a very interesting statement. He said he always was reluctant. But we convinced him. Just a few more troops, Mr. President. Light, the favorite expression was light at the end of the tunnel. And Westmoreland was a lion sack of you-know-what, too. The lie began with Westmoreland. Because he's the one who knows we're getting our ass kicked over there. Lies to McNamara about how many more troops we need. Lies about the death toll. Jacks those numbers up of VC. NVA and VC death toll. See, if you just had a few more troops, we'll finish them off. And then what happens? Tet offensive. Yeah. End of January, 68. Blows the whole thing wide open. That was the end for LBJ. Two months later, comes on national TV, offers the peace overture, and tells us he's not going to run for president. That was, that was a greater shock than anything. He would have won in 68. And watch what happens. One month after LBJ's out of the running, who jumps in? Bobby Kennedy. Bobby would have won in 68. I'm not a big fan of his son, but Bobby would have won had he not been killed. He would have beat Nixon. Nixon knew it, too. He was shaking in his boots when Bobby, he admits this to Nixon in his memoirs, told Kissinger several times that he's he was worried. Bobby is in this race. It's going to be a replay of 60. It might be close, but he'll win. And I, I, I convinced Bobby would have won. He was, he won. After winning that California primary, there was going to be, he was a juggernaut. There's no stopping him. And he's killed. Yeah. <laughs> you have to admit that's a bit suspicious. Oh, of course it is. 
there's some kind of conspiracy there. Some Sirhan Sirhan claims that because Bobby was pro-Israel, well, shit. What president, politician hasn't been down to the present? Yeah. Nah, he was bullshit. He was hired by somebody. God knows who. Right? James Earl Ray was too. Yep. It's, it's who? Who? Who was that? RFK Jr. talks about that when he visited James Earl Ray um, in prison. And I think Martin Luther King's son visited James Earl Ray in prison as well too and said the same thing. Yeah. He confessed. He did. He won't reveal, but he said, yes, he was hired. I mean, that's obvious. You know, we, we love to believe, oh, it's a lone assassin. Geez, I was just, I'm, I'm sure you've seen it. I started watching on Netflix, our favorite. Our Octopus's favorite. Uh, Garden, whatever it is. The, no, the... no. Manhunt about Abraham Lincoln's assassination. Oh, I got to watch that. I haven't seen that. That's cool. It's really well done. I've watched it maybe one or two episodes only. And, you know, John, it was good. that was a conspiracy. At the same time, Booth was, oh, shit. Oh, the the Abe Lincoln uh, assassination. Yes. Yeah, there's multiple people. Yes. Yeah. I knew that, but I didn't realize the extent of how complicit the Confederacy was, the, the hangers on, the fanatics. Civil War is not my ballywick, obviously, but it's fascinating. It's really well done. I got a three parts on a, the John Lennon assassination. I really recommend that guy's work. Um, David Whelan, he's a documentary filmmaker. Um, but if you look up his name, David Whelan, John Lennon assassination, all the articles that pop up like from Daily Mail and all these places, they actually reported on it. There was two types of ammunition found in John Lennon's body. Mark Chapman has always stated that he used full or he used um, hollow point bullets. He always stated that. The police reports, which he sent to me, the, where the inventory list yeah, was. Yeah, yeah. There's hollow point bullets listed there, but the morgue receipt says hollow points and then another caliber of bullets. Now, you can use those two types of ammunition in the gun that Mark Chapman used, the fiber. But the way that like the doctor who said treated John Lennon, if you look up his name, Stephen Lynn, there's articles that say doctor lied for 30 years. He did it for the fame. He didn't actually see John Lennon's wounds. So the guy actually stepped forward who actually treated John Lennon. He said, yeah, he said the only way you can get four tight, close grouping shots like that would have to be if someone was standing right in front of you. And Mark Chapman was from behind. Holy shit. Yeah. So like he, he really explained it. Like I said, each one of his episodes is like two hours long. So he really goes in depth and like, it's kind of like the Kennedy stuff for me. I yeah, can't yeah, really yeah. tell yeah. you that it's like, this is this and this is that. Yeah. What I can tell you is that there was Joy on West who visited Jack Ruby. Joy on West was an MK Ultra doctor. That's a little suspicious. Mm. But Milton Klein was an MK Ultra doctor who's in a documentary you can watch right now on YouTube. In 1978, they did a documentary about MK mm. Ultra. And he says, I can make a patsy within three months. That's what Milton Klein said. Well, guess who visited Mark Chapman in his cell right before he pleads guilty? Milton Klein. So yeah, like sure. you go, why are these people even being attached to this? And that's like the stuff for me. It was like, look at the whole seventies, the sixties. And why is that time period specific to lone assassins? Why it's that is not. so that, that cannot be just like a random, I know people no. want to go, oh, you're being conspiracy, but I'm like, we haven't really had any lone assassins since. So like examine that, except that maybe you can say Reagan, but even then, yeah. that guy, he, he wasn't yeah, affected. And, and, and Garfield, that, too. What is Garfield it? and McKinley. What, what was this? Who was the Reagan shooter? I forgot his name. John something. Well, John no. Hinckley. He just, he just made a new album. So it's like he's playing acoustic <laughs> guitar on YouTube. He's doing fine. Yeah, so sure. Getting to this <laughs> moment where I'm like, if you look at the whole 60s and 70s, who do we got? JFK, RFK, MLK, John Lennon. You know, you got, and they're all like lone assassin types. And I'm like, where has that been after? You don't see a no. whole lot of it after. No. The thing is, historically, if you look at, because Lincoln was shot by Booth, that's the lone assassin. Yeah. But he was part of a really widespread yeah. grand conspiracy, man, like, whoa, frightening himself. Now, Garfield, no. Some disgruntled employee, 1881, right? McKinley, same thing, an anarchist. Lone Gunman, 1901. Well, there's even a new film coming out about um, Jonestown. The whole, there's Leonardo DiCaprio's playing it, but Harvey Milk. Yes. 
there was two people killed in that one, but nobody knows why. It can't just be because he was gay. And what did they come out with? The Twinkie defense? As a thing, like the guys jacked up on sugar, coke, and all these other types of fast food products, and that's why he goes in and shoots Harvey Milk. But what did Harvey Milk do? He was friends with Jim Jones and wrote plenty of letters to Jim Jones. Not saying he knew the full extent of what was going on there, but there's obviously some weird things going on with the amount of money that was being funneled into Jonestown, too. Precisely. And Moscone's killed, too, which, so yeah. wait a minute. See, that's, that's the connection. Like, wait, why would you kill the mayor? Who's down the hall? He literally walks down the hall and kills poor George Moscone. Yeah. Which is like, makes no sense. But my excuse was, oh, because he and Milk were buddies and Moscone was pro-gay and all this bullshit. I mean, it scared me because like, you remember Bohemian Grove was a conspiracy for the longest time and we just had Nixon mention it. But then you just had Kid Rock on a podcast talk about being there. And then you can look up the footage of it. It's like a lot of footage of it now. People are just constantly finding it. And I'm like, I hope they found a new spot. Like, But for the longest time, that was a conspiracy that politicians were going out into the woods and just having like these weird things. And I don't know the extent of where it goes, but I've had an academic on my show explain it and he said they're just setting policy i'm like in front of an owl statue and he was like what's wrong with that i was like that's freaking weird man but like that's what i'm saying it's like it's so hard to talk about these because then people go like okay you might be off the deep end but for me i'm just looking at it like i don't know i find it fascinating because we've it somehow we've, that about that we've like built that. up walls in our head where each uh, each one of us has a defining line for instance, if I told you JFK was killed as a result of a conspiracy, a lot of people would be like, eh. Or, but if you say Fred Han Fred Hampton was killed by a conspiracy, people go, oh, 100%, I believe it. And I'm like, hang on a second. It doesn't just stop. It just it keeps going in different scenarios. And that's why it's so important to learn about your history. You don't have to get involved in politics today, but for God's sakes, learn about these presidents and understand that what you might have been taught in school might not have been true. It might be a different way around. <laughs> it's all bullshit. But what's taught in public schools today is just like, what? <laughs> I'm surprised there's teaching even going on. I think most kids are probably on the tablet. Oh, yeah. They do. I got them in class <laughs> right now. I'm college at the college level. Shit, <laughs> it's amazing. It's um, let me tell you, you're an anomaly. Most young people your age could give two shits about any of this. It's really pathetic, and that's going to hurt us as a nation down the road. Down the road, I'll be gone. You'll still be around. You'll reap what they don't sow. But we look up to people like yourself who've given me time on various episodes to be able to talk about some of your knowledge and at least some context to the conversation. I mean, these these will be recorded and put up there as long as the Internet's around. Um, so hopefully we live on, we'll live on a posterity, you and I. Yeah, so they create AI versions of us. Yeah, AI versions of ourselves. No, but John, every time I talk to you, man, I learn something new. I'm always happy to chat with you. You're a wealth of information, but I don't want to take up too much of your time here, but um, where can people find your links? And also we'll have to get you back on again to discuss some more subjects closer to when your book comes out, hopefully before that too. Yeah. Yeah. Just, you can just go on, I guess, Amazon and different places and there's a bunch of links there, but I don't really, I, I keep a low public profile. I really don't put myself out there too much, but you can find me always. <laughs> I'll make sure I link whatever links I have for you in the description. And I always appreciate the conversations. And thanks, everybody, listen for this episode of Out of the Blanket. Stay tuned for our next episode.